Discover how you can green your life by building a knowledge base of current sustainable and eco-savvy trends. This series will delve into hot topics, current standards and practices, ways to design better spaces, and specify materials that benefit not only us as consumers, but the world as a whole. Members of Caragreen, as sustainable materials distributors, and other industry leaders weigh in throughout the series. This is Build Green, Live Green. Uh, this is Jessica with Build Green, Live Green, Kara Green's podcast on sustainability, safety, and all things, you know, kind of green emerging. Today we have David Charles with us from AIA St. Louis, and um, we're really excited to have you. You had us on your podcast recently, and we had um, some good conversations there, and we wanted to talk to you because I think you have a really unique chapter, and you guys have a really unique setup, and you've been able to kind of face the challenges that we've all faced in the past couple of years in a very, a very strategic and different way. Um, so let's let's talk talk a little bit about your chapter, your AIA chapter in St. Louis, um, and why it's different, and also a little bit of background on you know how you ended up you know leading that chapter. Absolutely. Uh, well, first and foremost, Jessica, I just want to thank you for having me today, of and I'm very um, happy to have Kara Green as an active uh, member of the Resource Center too. Um, so it's great to talk a little bit further about it. So I'll start with my background. Um, I spent years in the retail industry um, of all things uh, within the nonprofit world. I was an assistant manager at the Missouri History Museum. And then when I left that, I had done my uh, undergraduate and graduate work at University of Kansas um, in architecture. Um, And I had worked at a firm for a little bit. But uh, when this opportunity with AIA came up, it blended my um, educational properties with my uh, work with uh, people. So it was just Mm -hmm. uh, two for one, a perfect fit. And I've loved it ever since. But with AIA St. Louis, our chapter uh, is different and being one of the first founded close to AIA National. And with our location in the Midwest, we've really taken a pulse on uh, moving forward in uh, the profession and doing things that advocate for not only sustainability and building materials, uh, but also with representation. Uh, we started a few different committees this year, um, one of which is um, JEDI, uh, one dealing with justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and another one, COAT, Committee on the Environment. Yep. Um, but with the Resource Center, uh, my role as manager is um, having the collaborative space for building product manufacturers and representatives with connecting them to the uh, greater a and industry. And we do this in the space by not only having uh, continuing education opportunities, uh, both in person and virtual, but having a space where uh, architects can come in, use our materials library, and really learn about uh, the uh, stories behind these products. And what I love about Kira Green is there is a a larger story behind um, just the materiality, but what it does to the product and the the building itself. So being able to tell that story uh, is very important. And um, we are happy to have just celebrated our two-year anniversary uh, in October. Thank you so much. Um, so we we really are, are proud to show it off. And um, last week, I was telling you earlier, we um, had the AIA St. Louis Design Awards and opened up our space um, as kind of a pre-reception uh, to everybody um, with good good praise. So um, there's a lot more to come and uh, to sort of some of the things that make AIA St. Louis different. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you talk about um, the resource center and the resource really is the actual physical samples and interaction with those physical samples that architects and you know really really need architects and designers really really need and also then the education piece is you know kind of the learning things are moving really quickly in terms of you know circularity and BIM and all this stuff biophilic design and just having a place for people to come and learn that stuff I mean there's only so much time you have to Google and hunt that stuff down so you guys are kind of curating the most important things and bringing them into this space and also giving them that physical interaction um, with the materials. Yes, absolutely. And um, I love what you said about curating uh, kind of a story and curating different 
um, shelves to um, tell that story and, and let people know of all that is going on, uh, particularly in the 2030 challenge going on with uh, mm-hmm. climate health and um, making sure that we have a more sustainable planet and we use environmentally impactful practice. Um, and with the center itself, um, being able to uh, have people come in and uh, pr- practitioners who are from larger firms um, that have uh, libraries within their space, um, we felt it important for those who are either in smaller firms or even independent practitioners. Um, something that we've seen in the past year and a half, um, a lot of um, architects have broken away from their um, workspaces to make their own schedules and to um, kind of do things more independently. Uh, so the Resource Center has been great in um, having that uh, access available to them as well, because everybody has their own part in um bettering design for our world. Um, so making that accessible is really important. So you mentioned, you, and you mentioned the libraries and, and some of these smaller firms starting up. It is really hard if you're a you know small or small to mid-sized firm to bring everything into a space, especially now where people are actually probably moving away from having these large permanent spaces and moving more and towards a, a hybrid model where people are remote and they do need these places where they can get together. So, um, I mean, it, just our samples, the samples that Kara Green carries, it takes up a lot of space. I can't imagine someone trying to work from home in having the entire suite of, you know, um, Shaw carpet or, you know, solid surface. It's just, it would be really, really difficult to do that. So I think um, it's a gr- it's a great concept that you're doing. And um, with, with that, I would kind of segue to, um, if you planned on having a collaborative place. We all know that designers are trying to pare down their libraries and they don't want physical, you know, they're trying to minimize physical libraries and have, you know, really strict criteria for what can be in a physical library. And further, they're going to a lot of digital libraries. When you set out two years ago with the Resource Center, the world looked very different than it does now in terms of what's driving the need for a collaborative space. Can you talk a little bit about here's what we thought was happening and then Here's what happened, and here's where we are today. Because I think it's a that's a really neat story too. Absolutely, um, and I really uh, agree with what happened in the past um, and what we thought the vision was for the center has evolved through time. Um, in the past, um, traditionally with lunch and learns and other informational sessions, um, we assumed that everything would be in person because that was the the model of not only um, learning about new uh, products and for uh, reps to connect with the architects, but also um, having it in a community space. Um, So instead of going from firm to firm, we thought that it would be um, more advantageous to have everybody gather in one area. And being in downtown St. Louis um, next to our convention center, it is um, a very lucrative location and we have loved it. And then during the pandemic, uh, it definitely shifted because nobody could meet together. Uh, So we, uh, especially for me, finding a way to still um, meet our mission and bringing both uh, strong groups and and learning from each other. Um, And as well, the construction industry was still going. So um, mm-hmm. architectural projects uh, were still on the on the docket and, and people were fortunately able to um, see um, their designs come to life. Um, we adapted a virtual uh, platform on Zoom. So our classes were for a year um, online. So um, about two to three times a week, I would schedule um, lunch and learns, uh, most uh, HSW credit, uh, which is mm-hmm. lucrative or the holy grail, of course. Right. Right. And um, we have had uh, very good attendance through that because even though um, people can see each other physically, um, the virtual world and social media were so important in um, getting people together and in getting new product information out. Um, with the Resource Center, speaking of social media, uh, we mm-hmm. have multiple channels such as LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, so uh, is it, what is, what are the handles like, like for um, like Instagram or, or, or LinkedIn? Is it the Resource Center St. Louis? What's the actual name? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so it's the Resource Center at AIA St. Louis, or if you hashtag TRC AIA STL on any of those four, uh, everything will pop up instantly. And uh, okay. we tend to update it um, daily. Um, and then it's wonderful with our um, repertoire of vendors, um, over 160 right now. So we share the latest and greatest from, uh, or try to share the latest and greatest from each of them, uh, but definitely um, diversify it. And uh, we also have our product of the month specials. Mm -hmm. So uh, during the pandemic, we were able to still um, do a special focus on um, products and uh, vendors that have uh, sort of offerings that can really help the architect and not just with the solid surface or the interiors, but the exterior framework and mm -hmm. foundational as well. Um, because with, in comparison to other libraries that are um, beautiful and in interiors, we um, are more encompassing with everything that deals with the, the uh, project and the uh, building uh, platform as a whole. Um, so that was really, um, pertinent to now where uh, architects are getting back into in-person and, and slowly um, moving back to what it was before. But I think now it's not only the need to learn from uh, reps and, and kind of get that information, but also just to see each other, um, yeah. which a lot of- like Connect, like, like literally like emotionally connect with someone, like not over an email, but like actually have like a that human engagement. I think people are craving that. I think you're dead on. Yeah, absolutely. And I know even for me, um, going into the office, because I have a remote schedule, but I love um, being inside the center, even on days where I am uh, supposed to be remote, I happily schedule meetings and get in, because there's nothing like feeding off of someone's energy yeah. face to face. And, and a lot like the um, products, as we were talking about earlier with uh, kind of online material banks. Um, there's nothing like that tactile experience, not only with right. people, but with, with products and learning from those who um, inherit all that information. So I think um, that need for interaction with others, again, uh, coupled with the product uh, knowledge is going to just soar, make the resource. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, I've been to a couple meetings lately, like, like in-person meetings, one in Arizona, one in Atlanta. And I literally came home physically exhausted, not in a bad way. I had so much fun, but I'm so not used to that level of like mental engagement and human interaction that it like takes it out of you. And I, and I felt great. I loved it the whole time, but you don't realize how much we've missed it. And so you get home and you're like, kind of like a little zombie in a coma on the couch being like, that was a lot. I definitely agree with you. And um, it's kind of talking on that too. Um, my boss and I, um, we tell a story of um, our leadership um, program uh, within AIA that we just started this year as well, had a meeting, um, their introductory one with 20 architects in the resource center. And mm -hmm. the energy was just palpable. Everyone was having fun. Everyone was engaging with each other. They yeah. spent the whole day. And um, we were both tired at the end of it, but we were so exhilarated. Just yeah. Like, there are people and, and you get to see them learning and, and, and um, you, 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 it feeds off of you. It's very infectious. Uh, the other thing I've noticed too is that when you're in those settings, there's not that distraction of let me check my phone, let me check my email. Like it's very easy for me on a Zoom call to be like, oh, this guy said the same thing last time and go over here, check a couple emails and get distracted. But when you're in that per, you know, in-person you know, in engagement, it's just so much, you know, easier to like impart yourself and, and participate without, you know, cause you can read body language and you know, you're not, you're not on mute. Um, maybe I'm sure some people would like to mute me sometimes, but still. Oh no, no, no me, me more, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I definitely agree. And also to that small talk that happens after, especially a lunch and learn where yeah. you get to know the person even further and, and not just be strictly business. Cause on zoom, a lot of times you are more, regimented to, okay, we have enough time for A, B, C, D, and it's not as much kind of a free flow where um, if you vibe with someone, you can kind of um, go on a separate corner and, and, and talk further business. Um, yeah. So that's really um, nice to see in, in person too. Yeah. And, and it, that actually kind of leads me to something else I wanted to touch on is, you know, when I go to these meetings and there's a 
someone says something and it's like, ooh, that would be a good blog topic. Or it's something that catches my ear, I guess. And I always jot it down because it's 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 a it's an interesting topic and I think there's something behind it. And you did a a, um, a session recently on aging in place. And that's one of those things that I think is a relevant topic that needs more information around it when it comes to kind of the design and architecture side of things. So can you talk a little bit about that? And also, as you talk about that, what are some other subjects like that that uh, the Resource Center plans to tackle in 2022-ish? <sighs> Absolutely. Um, for aging in place, um, I'm so glad you mentioned that because it's one of um, dear, dear to my heart. Um, my parents um, had downsides from their home that they've spent many decades and moved into a condo. And they are um, they're significantly older than me. I won't say how much older, but um, I, I, I'm the baby. I'll just say that. Um, but seeing them um, adapt to new um, sort of environmental uh, kind of world, it, it was a change. And it felt for me that so many other people are dealing with that right now, where um, someone that used to be able to um, have 4,000 or 5,000 square feet needs to have, over many floors, needs to just have one um, and do so safely um, and also to ensure the quality of life. And um, with a lot of homes, uh, many people who um, furnish and, and design their dream home, um, having to leave that is, regardless of age, very, very, it can be traumatic because it's something where you are leaving what you thought would be forever. So um, I wanted to have this aging in place um, because um, there's so much information out there about it. And we were able to partner with um, Sherman Williams and ATS Stainless. Um, the individual for that is with mm -hmm. our AIA Custom Residential Architects Network. Yep. Um, and then we also did a very uh, wonderful partnership with uh, Hamoda or the Home Modification Occupational Therapist Network. Uh, because with great design, it's not just about architects. Um, it's about knowledge and making spaces better. And I think if you are able to um, gather um, information from others, um, especially with therapists, because you never know um, if a body is getting it mobile and um, forming the home to be more susceptible to them. Um, one thing I learned from them is that um, bathrooms um, for if you install grab bars in bathrooms uh, and making it easier for people to enter in and out is very, very helpful. Um, but for the uh, definition of aging in place um, from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, it's the ability to live in one's own home and community safely, independently and comfortably, regardless of age, income or ability level. Um, and that's, I think, something that can be um, applied to um, so many other things, um, mm -hmm. which happens to be with diversity or even location geographically. Um, everyone is um, entitled to living in a space that makes them feel comfortable because that's mm -hmm. where you are the most safe. And I feel like where you have the less, the least inhibitions, you can uh, don't have to worry about the outside world and, and heaven knows there's too much going on there. Um, yes. But, just being you know, one at home. Yeah. Yeah. And as you talk about that, you know, aging in place, it kind of reminds me of kind of the definition of or the intent behind sustainability, you know, something that can can continue, you know, in a in a kind of a, you know, a safe, healthier environment. Right. And I think that's what we're we're all sort of striving for, just coming at it in all these different ways. But yeah, you're I mean, you're right. I think, um, you know, the you know, it, you want your you want your parents to be in a safe place, and I don't think we think about those things. But I can imagine once you go through it, you're looking every time you go into a space now to see if it's suitable for you know. You probably think a lot about that because um, you've gone through it with your parents, and I'm sure that there are firms out there that you know design specifically for that. Um, you know, and and you know we're we're past the point of just you have to deal with what you have to deal with and, and we can design around it. And there's this awareness of that. So I'm excited to see that grow as well. Um, it, there is another subject I wanted to touch on with you because it, it crops up in many different ways. And I imagine you're seeing some of it too. Um, we're trying to figure out how to help with it, you know, as a distributor of building materials, um, we're running into supply chain issues and there's, they're, they're all over the place and they're in all different areas. And I'm sure, 
you've heard, you know, talk of it or, or, you know, people they're you know, expressing their woes over what they can't get. Um, is there anything that can be done at the design level or architecture level to kind of get ahead of some of these supply chain issues? Or is it these pinch points? Oh, it's the, it's long beach. It's containers out of China. My spec isn't coming out for three years. So I don't really know what the problem is going to be then. I don't have a crystal ball or are people today saying, Oh my God, David, help. I specified this Italian terrazzo. I can't get it. Is there anything that looks like this? <laughs> is that happening? Yeah. What are you seeing in the supply chain world? Yes, that's an excellent question. Uh, especially in the supply chain world, it has run the gamut. Um, but one th com commonality that I've heard is that everything's taking so much longer <laughs> than it should be to be in projects or um, even getting specifications. And I love how you noted um, the containers that are arriving mm -hmm. from overseas, because I do think that is a strong component in that they, it's essentially just a, a matter of, of physically transporting it to the um, design site. But I do think as designers, and um, they appreciate when material companies can have options on hand, or if they can have a, a quick ship list uh, where uh, there are comparable uh, materials that can be um, used in the first bit and then maybe replaced or even just, um, replicated in the future. Because yeah. I know, um, depending on the project, if it's, say, like a base model project or for a multi-unit um, facility or mm -hmm. something that is for um, a, a home buyer um, for personal use, it's something that, although the material chain is hindered, the projects are going to keep going. The contractors yeah. are experiencing a pile up of um, projects that they have um, been doing since the pandemic and new ones. So I think it's important for companies to um, accelerate along with the trends um, mm -hmm. and also being honest with the architect or designer, letting them know these issues. Because if yes. you um, give them false promises, then that's the easiest way to, you know, um, <laughs> cut that relationship. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Definitely, yeah. Over, right now, the best thing that you can do in the absence of these materials is over communicate so that people can plan. I totally agree with you. And honesty, of course, is always um, the best policy. Um, but I always encourage my team over communicate, like it, just keep them over informed. Don't make them come to you and ask proactively tell them things like that. But, you know, it kind of makes me think as we wind this up here, that's a, that's a whole other subject that might be worth having a, some sort of panel or discussion on, you know, how to, how to navigate, you know, specifications during the supply chain crunch. And is there something that you guys could do as a center to kind of pair up, you know, someone who can't find something with, you know, a possible solution or, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's there's something in the middle there between my my you know issue and avail with availability and specifications that with the materials just not there. There's a space in the middle where I feel like um, there may be a conversation that could result in some solutions. I don't know. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of uh, 2022, um, some of the uh, programs that we look to. Um, in again, include a week of sustainability, but something mm -hmm. about specifications and materiality yeah. is something that uh, we could add because it is for us as a center um, pertinent to connect um, people with those who know um, not only about the, the sample, but the timeline and how to get yeah. it. Um, yeah. So I think those, as you said, over communicating and, and um, just publicizing ways for others to learn about um, timelines and, and, and solutions and also alternatives that they may have not thought of, but um, provide a better output for the environment. Um, yeah, so exactly. something like Geo's um, yeah. services that we have, um, recycled glass is an incredible countertop. Um, yeah. <laughs> then it's different than others, um, but it, it does wonderful things in repurposing and, and making an impact. Yeah, I think it's really funny to me. I, I, I have realized of late that these drums that we've been pounding for years around lead, where we were talking about local, reclaimed materials, recycled materials, rapidly renewable materials, they all are getting a second look now, not because they're sustainable, but 
because they are sustainable, but in a, outside of lead, they're available. And they're available for all the reasons that they're sustainable. The recycled content is there, local stuff's there. So it's really interesting how there's been this kind of resurgence in those characteristics of materials because of the supply chain crunch. So again, I think it's a really interesting topic. I get really excited hearing about it because I like I like problem solving and I think we've got a year of that ahead of us. We really do. And that's something that um, I would love to see future collaborations and, and more expansion on because that is something yeah. that um, yeah. will be even more pertinent um, going into 2022. All right. Well, David, thank you so much. And just keep on curating, educating, and collaborating. We have... Um, Really enjoyed working with you and loved having you on our podcast today. Thank you, Jessica. It's an honor to um, have me on and, and have you part of the Resource Center. And we can't wait to have you come in person to see us in St. Louis. <laughs> I can't wait. It'll be great. We will plan that soon. Thanks, okay. David. Thank you so much. This is Jessica with Kara Green, and this is Build Green Lip Green. <laughs>